Ms. Anglina. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is an unprepared welcome address. So, um, pardon me. All right. I would, I would like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this is Christ Palace International Ministries. Um, we've been in existence from 2016. Uh, we are shepherded by uh, Dr. Mark Amwati, uh, a very uh, spirit-filled pastor. Uh, for those of us who fellowship here, we know what we've received over the years. Spiritual upbringing uh, has been excellent. So I want to welcome every student, every person, uh, whether you are a student or not, please, you are welcome. Uh, we have a campus ministry here at Christ Palace. Um, it's uh, shepherded or headed, uh, coordinated by myself, Miss Lina, could you please? Yes. Uh, we have Pastor Santua at the back. We have uh, Miss Ari also at the back. She's waving. And uh, it's a ministry that kind of uh, helps our students to settle here in Christ's palace. Um, we've all been students, I've been a student. Most of the coordinators have been students, and we all know how important community helps, right? Uh, some of the, uh, this, uh, the immigration clinic we're about to have, uh, as a student, I never had it. I never knew the, the, the various ways of immigrating to the United States. I, have, I had to finish my program, I had to do further training before I even got to know that there was something like this. So. This ministry helps students to kind of get to know all the legal ways of immigrating, anything that would help the students to thrive. And so I'd like to once again want to welcome everyone. If you are not, uh, if you're not fellowshipping with us, we would want to encourage you uh, to come visit us one day. Uh, even tomorrow, you can come and visit us. So thank you everyone, and I hope you have a very wonderful session. Thank you. So next on the agenda, we'll have um, Bruna give us a presentation, but before that, I'll go ahead and read her bio. So Bruna Froda is a distinguished lawyer licensed in Texas and New York with a career spanning over a decade in American immigration law. Renowned for her expertise, she has made significant contributions while working at some of the nation's largest law firms. In 2017, Bruna founded the Immigration and Nationality Law Group, INLG, aiming to deliver comprehensive immigration legal services. As the principal attorney, she has led the firm to excellence managing operations, handling cases, offering strategic advice, and representing clients in complex matters, thereby upholding the highest standard of legal representation and client service. Bruna offers specialized consulting services to the Brazilian consulate in Houston, assisting with legal issues that impact Brazilian nationals. Additionally, her legal insight is valued by major corporations such as Tramonita, Tramotina, USA Inc., um, where she consults on immigration law, compliance, and other legal matters, demonstrating her ability to adapt um, expertise across various contests and industries. And I'll pass the mic to you, Bruna. Thank you. Now I feel like. <laughs> I have big shows to fill today. Um, so thanks so much for coming. I know um, Saturday morning is our day that we can rest and you came here to like watch our presentation. So I feel very honored by that. And I wanna also thank you, um, the Christ Palace for organizing the event. It was really well done and uh, I'm impressed by how equipped you are. Uh, I hope that today I am the channel to uh, channel of God, right? To pass you the information that you are looking for regarding immigration law. I am originally from Brazil, so if you don't understand my English, if the accent is too strong, let me know and I can repeat myself. Um, I came originally because uh, my husband is an engineer and he works for an oil and gas company and I came as a dependent under his visa. I went back to law school, just like you guys who are studying here, a lot of you, I guess. And um, as Pastor said, I didn't know, or we didn't know the ways to stay in the US with a green card. So it was not until 
like the company decided to sponsor him for a green card and we at the time we thought that this was the only way so we were like in the mercy of the company to stay here and then eventually we heard about the EB2 and IW visa which we could have leveraged before and we didn't because of our lack of knowledge so I hope today I can give you some insights on the visas that you can self-sponsor as well as the visas that you can have a sponsor um, a US company or even an individual helping you out um, you can go to the next slide We need a secret sign, I guess. <laughs> Good. Um, all right, so I think um, Dr. Franklina um, just did a nice job explaining who I am and uh, what we do, so I'm not gonna be wasting your time again um, talking about myself. Today, as I said, I'm gonna be, um, I'll go over the most common types of green cards um, available based on sponsorship, um, of course a job offer, or through your own professional achievements. And I'll also touch base on one of the most common family-based green cards if you marry a US citizen or a green card holder, which is also a possibility, right? You have been here for some time, you are studying, you meet someone in school, and then this person is a US citizen or green card holder, and that person wants to sponsor you. So that's what we're gonna be covering today. I'll also go over some of the temporary work visas, and also the way that you can work while you study, such as going through the OPT option, the CPT, um, and as well as if you have any hardship, um, to pay for your tuitions, for example, you can also request a work permit. Um, you can go to the next slide. Well, that's the law firm, not me now. I'm talking about on behalf of the law firm now. Um, we have about 70 employees. Um, I am the main attorney, but we have another attorney too, an associate attorney, her name is Caroline. And we have a staff of 70 people. Um, and what I can tell you about INLG, what is our difference um, from other law firms, is that we try to make ourselves um, reachable. Okay. Um, I don't know if uh, it's WhatsApp, it's a way that you communicate frequently, but that's usually what our clients like the most about us. When we have a case with us, um, you're not gonna be just talking to us via email or text message or via a phone call. We're gonna have a group with you that not only myself, but the paralegals working on your case, the billing team, everybody will be on that group. And uh, we are available 24 seven. So that's one of our biggest differentials, I would say. Uh, sometimes lawyers here in the US, they are not reachable it's very easy to sign a contract but then the, after this the, the contract is signed um, there is no way to reach your legal team so that's one of our biggest differential um, of course we can talk about our technical knowledge but of, this is something that you expect from the law firm that you are hiring anyways so I'm not gonna be expanding on that right now we have about 400 ongoing cases and we serve a lot of corporations, we serve high net worth individuals and highly educated individuals. So before I start uh, the presentation itself, going through the technical um, information that you are looking for, I want to know who my audience is and I wanted to talk to my audience as I speak. Um, who has a, an F1 visa here? Okay, I would say 75%, right? You all have F1 visas and are you studying um, bachelor's level, master's level, PhD level, what are you guys studying? PhD, master's. Okay, I feel intimidated now. <laughs> 
You are super smart people. And who here is a US citizen already who has a green card? Good, okay. Um, and who is here as a tourist and is looking for ways to remain in the US? Nobody, okay. Who is here with a work visa? Like an H1B, L visa, O visa? Nobody, okay. Who has a, a pending asylum application? Nobody. Okay, good. So I know who my audience is. Um, you can go to the next slide. J1. Oh, J1, yes. So it goes, so what type of J1? Research scholar, trainee, research, research scholar. scholar. Okay. Do you have that two year home residency requirement on your visa grade? Okay, you're good. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the first type of green card um, that I want to talk about is the EB1A. So, of course, when we are talking about immigration, you guys are super knowledgeable, it seems like, that we are referring to visas by letters, right? Usually in numbers. So this type of visa, it stands for, EB stands for employment-based, and the one means is the priority to workers visa category. So basically, people under this category have um, higher chance of getting a green card when compared to other employment-based visa applications. So this is known as the Einstein visa, uh, just because when Einstein came to the US, it was the type of green card that he was um, granted. But it doesn't mean that you have to be like Einstein, even though I know that some of you are. <laughs> you are as smart as Einstein. Basically, under this type of visa, you can sponsor yourself without a job offer, or you can have a company sponsoring you. It doesn't matter, it doesn't give you a higher chance of approval if you have a company sponsoring you, um, if you self-sponsor. But as, um, as an extraordinary ability individual, you're gonna have to show that you meet at least three of the criteria out of the 10 statutory criteria out there. And I'll give you, I'll go through the most common criteria that you are eligible to meet as students, right, as researchers, it seems like, that you are. And also, not only that, not only you have the objective criteria, you also have the subjective criteria, which is you have to show that you have sustained that level of um, achievement on a national or international level. So you have the objective criteria and you have the subjective criteria. When you talk about the objective criteria, um, it's not here, it's on the next slide, but what I can tell you is it is a very fast type of green card. You can pay for, uh, you can pay an extra fee for the government to adjudicate your case faster. So I would say that nowadays you can have your green card in six months, okay? That's super quick. So if you have, for example, an F1 visa and you are about to graduate, your program is finishing, and you qualify for the EB1A, I encourage you to do the filing as of today. And basically the government can only issue a certain number of visas per year. And under this category, usually the government never meets that quota. So it means that it's fast because of that, because you can expedite the adjudication of the petition of the government agreeing that you are an extraordinary ability individual and that the government can issue a visa. You can extend the green card to your spouse and to your children under the age of 21. And that's valid for green card applications, not only the EB1A, okay? 
So those are the criteria, right? We have 10 criteria outlined there. Some of them will not apply to you because you are not artists or you are not athletes. So I will focus on the academic related criteria more than the other ones. But in your case, what I would say that would make your case very strong or make you qualify for the petition is the number of researches that you have. Okay, research is really good. You're gonna have to, of course, um, publish the research and make sure that the research is either cited by the, the academia, right? You have a lot of people citing you. Or if the research is that actually becomes utilized on, by the industry. So if they, they research is not only on a paper, but you have um, investors or you have other universities or other people interested in your research and make it more practical. The other type of criteria that <clears throat> it's gonna be easy for you to meet is you being a peer, peer reviewer in a, like journals of international recognition. So it's very easy for you that you are a researcher, right? You can become a peer reviewer easily. The other criteria that is gonna be easy for you to meet is getting awards of excellence, getting awards for the work that you do. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be an award like an Oscar or a Grammy. You can get an award, for example, you can get a grant, like that you worked very hard to get your research, like to continue your research with a grant. Or you can like, you go to a Congress and there are a lot of participants in that Congress and you get an award for your paper, for your presentation. So there is like, a, a, I would say, huge range of arguments that we can make to make your case strong as far as showing that the award, it's really worth it. The other criteria that I believe it would be easy for you to meet is showing that you have made something in the industry that is considered major. And how do you prove that? Usually you can get letters of recommendation. So people in the industry, industry that have heard about you, have heard about your research, for example, the people that you review their work and they are citing your work, or like a company that is actually putting in practice your research. So that's all considered major contribution. And it's usually, as I said, through letters of recommendation, but then if you have also supporting evidence, such as something that it was covered by the media, right? Or if you have a trade magazine talking about your research, that's all considered major. So we have covered four so far. So remember that you said that you only need three to meet the objective requirements. The next one that would be easy for you to meet is the criterion of if you have um, a leadership role or an essential role in a distinguished organization. So let's say you are a professor at a very well-known university, an Ivy League university, or even a university that is very, it's a esteemed university worldwide. And it was like you were invited to be a professor it was not just like you had to compete with people for that position, but you were invited. This is an example of having an essential role or a leadership role in a distinguished organization. But let's say you work as an engineer in an oil and gas company, or as a doctor at a hospital, and you do neurosurgery, or you do like pastor Adam, right? That it's a neuroscientist. And you show that your role is really crucial for your employer. 
that's considered essential. And how you can show that? Usually letters of recommendation, okay? The other criteria that I believe it would be easy for you to meet is being part of an association that other members are also other distinguished individuals. So let's say you are, and I don't know the name of the scientist that you deal with, but let's say you are part of um, an association that Einstein is also part of. So Einstein would not belong to any association, right? So um, it doesn't matter only the way that you participate in the association, how, like how you became a member. Usually those associations you are invited. Or let's say you are part of the board of directors of the association and then in order for you to, uh, to get to that position, you had to go through, let's say, uh, votes, you had to be part of a panel and then you were voted for that. So that's important. And I believe in your case um, that you are researchers, you probably belong to some associations. So the fact that you pay to become a member, that's not good for you. That will not meet the criteria, okay? The other criteria, the other criterion that I believe you would qualify is um, any coverage by the media about your work. So I have clients that ask me, so if I post on LinkedIn, would that help me? And then I have a lot of viewers. No, it doesn't help. It has to, we have to show that that media has a national or international reach. Sometimes I'm able to argue that um, like media that it's only, we can only reach some regions is enough for this criterion, uh, but USCIS has been more strict on like who, who you are reaching when that media is covering your work. And nowadays, I would say that media is not 100% reliable anymore. <laughs> I have clients that sometimes they, they pay that for, the, for our journalists to cover that client's work. Um, but immigration doesn't know that, okay? But it's good for you to know that, of course, if you have an independent source to cover your work, that's really helpful. So it can be a trade magazine. It doesn't have to be like, uh, big broadcast to like lay people covering your job, covering your work, so to meet that criterion. It can be just like for your own type of professionals. Um, the other, and then I'll, I talked about the peer reviewer criterion, right? But if you are, let's say, you are studying and you are a PhD student, and you have to review the master thesis of some people in the university that also qualifies as being a judge of the work of others. Or if you work for a company and then you have direct reports, you can show that you review the work of those direct reports and this is considered uh, judging the work of others. Okay? I'm not gonna be covering the other, um, as I said, the remaining criterion because, as I said, they are more related to artists and athletes. Unless you have any questions about the other criterion that is left. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> All right. Um, so just going back to, just to conclude the AB1A petition, Remember that I said this, those are just the objective requirements. And then we also have the subjective requirement, which is showing that you have sustained that national or international recognition. And so basically what the government wants to make sure is that you are now four years old, but everything that you did happened when you were 20. And that did not continue. So you have to show that continuity to be able to provide 
proof of that subjective requirement. And then how you show that? Through the other evidence. So it's all about dates. So I have clients that they ask me, so should I go back all the way when I started my career to show that I am an extraordinary ability individual? Um, and my response is, it's always good to go back to how you started to show that you have made good progress. It's good for the petition itself, but it doesn't show that you have maintained that national or international recognition. We have to show, you have to focus more on what's going on now. The history will help with our argument. So now uh, I'll talk about the EB2 National Interest Waiver. And that's the type of green card that I would say most of you would qualify. This is the ugly cousin of the EB1A. Basically everything that I have discussed as criteria for the EB1A can be used as proof um, that you are an, an individual that is well positioned in your field of endeavor to contribute to the US on a national level. So the EB2 and IW is the employment-based second category type of green card. So there are less visas available that the government can issue. And right now, there is a little backlog on the EB2 and IW, meaning you can have your petition approved, but you cannot move forward with the filing of the green card until there are visas available on the EB2 and IW. So if you, if you were not born in China or India, you are in a good place. There is still backlog, but it's not as long as if you were born in India and China. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> yeah, so basically uh, the government wants to diversify the nationalities in the country. So since there are a lot of Indians and Chinese, uh, they have to base them out. But yes, there is, uh, there is this backlog now. Remember that I said with an EB1A, you can get your green card now in six months. With the EB2 and IW, probably your waiting time now is around two years altogether, okay? Both the, for the petition and the green card itself. So that's why the EB1A is more interesting for many of you that want a resolution faster. But sometimes, as attorneys, we like to go with the EB2 and IW because it's a safer option. But for the EB2 and IW, there, are, there is only one objective criterion for you to qualify, for you to apply for the petition. And the only objective criteria is that you have an advanced degree, meaning at least a master's degree, or a bachelor's degree plus five years of progressive experience, so five year post degree. Or if you don't have a master's or a bachelor's plus five, you can also qualify as an exceptional ability individual. So exceptional in that sense means less than extraordinary of the AB1A. So to qualify as an exceptional ability individual, there are also eight types of criteria and as long as you meet three of them, you would qualify. And um, the most common criterion that people with exceptional ability would qualify would be like having a degree that is related to your profession. And it can be like a certificate, it can be an associate's degree, and you have 10 years of experience, or, and you have earned a salary above average and or you have made contributions of major significance to the community or you have a leadership or essential role for a distinguished organization. So those are the most common types of evidence to show that you are exceptional ability, an exceptional ability individual. In your case, you don't have to worry about the exceptional ability uh, criteria because you meet the other objective requirement, which is a master's or a bachelor's plus five. 
Then you go into the subjective requirement of the national interest waiver, which is you have to show that you are an individual that is well positioned to advance in your field of endeavor, that there is an urgency for the government to approve your petition because of your qualifications. So there is no way that a company has to go through the labor certification process, which is advertising for the position, and if there are no US workers available, interested for the position, to extend the offer to you. So you have to show that there, there is this urgency. And also, you have to show that your work will reach or will benefit the US on a national level, okay? That's, I would say that that's the hardest criterion to meet. Um, because sometimes, let's say, you work as a researcher for a university. So what you are doing at the university is helping the university to get their name out there, right? To publish. Not necessarily you are extending your contributions outside, let's say, a region, a state, a city. So the national level criteria is the one that is hardest to prove, but it's still manageable. So if the EB2 and IW, because it's a very subjective petition, what I tell my clients is, you have to try. Right? You never know, you can get an officer that is more lenient or more, um, more sympathetic to your cause. I'll give you some examples so you understand what I'm saying. I had one client that he worked as a, an engineer for an oil and gas company. His salary was one million dollars a year. He had a PhD. He had a lot of publications. However, immigration said, your work is not impacting the US as a whole. I would deny your EB2 in that. And then I had another client who was a baker. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, right? Who was a baker and his case was approved. And he only employed like 15 people. But what we said is, he's a baker, but he is like moving all that food supply chain. <laughs> you see, it's all about the arguments. I'm not saying that the argument that we had for the engineer was weak. I'm just saying that it's very subjective. It really depends on who is reading your petition. So that's why I encourage you to try, okay? And it's very easy for us as attorneys to put together a petition for a scientist, for someone that is really doing like really intellectual heavy work. It's easier for us to justify the national importance of that position. Um, remember that I said um, that the evidence that you can gather for the EB2 and IW is very similar to the EB1 that I was just discussing. Um, and that's true, that's true, okay? Just the level of review that the officer at USCIS will have for the EB2 and IW <coughs> would be less heavy than for the EB1A. You can go to the next slide. So for the EB2 and IW, the same way as the EB1A, you don't need to have a job offer. You can self-sponsor your visa. Uh, but I would say the cases that I have a company sponsoring the EB2 and IW, I believe USCIS views it in a, with, in a better way, okay? But that said, I, the majority, the majority of my clients, they are self-sponsored. They don't have a job offer. And they do the EB2 and IW. Now I'll talk, even though it says there EB3 perm, the EB2 can also be done through a perm. And what's the perm? 
permits that a company, a U.S. company, or a U.S. citizen or a green card holder can sponsor a foreign national to work in the U.S. in a permanent position. So that U.S. company or that U.S. citizen or green card holder has to go through a process with the Department of Labor, get the Department of Labor to tell that U.S. company or U.S. citizen or green card holder how much the salary must be offered, okay, how much is the salary for the position, and advertise for the position so the company can show that no U.S. workers were interested or available or capable to accept the offer. So that's what the EB2 and IW is waiving, is the obligation that you, in that case, or the company has to go through the perm process. Okay? That's what the EB2 and IW does. So with the perm process, the waiting time now, if you do the EB2 or the EB3 as a skilled or professional worker. It's between, if it's an EB2, two years, as I said, and as an EB3 skilled or professional, three to four years, and as other workers, four to five years. So it's a long, long, long processing time. And that's, that's all about the visa backlog. So the EB3 is the employment-based third category. So it goes below the EB2, below the EB1, so there are less visas available. So that's why the waiting time is longer. And the people that qualify for those visas are not as qualified as the EB2 and the EB1 people. So of course the volume of applicants are high. So as I said, with the perm process, the company has to work with the Department of Labor first to get the Department of Labor to certify that job offer. And then after that company goes through that, the company has to file a petition with immigration and prove that the company or the individual has the ability to pay that salary. So one of the requirements is that the company shows um, their financials, okay? So that's one of the biggest roadblocks for a lot of people because if you have, for example, a small company sponsoring for the visa, that might be um, a showstopper, the ability to pay. And then for you as uh, beneficiaries, all you have to show, hi, how are you? The beneficiaries will have to show that you qualify for the position and it's all, it all depends on what were the requirements for the position. So let's say it's an engineer position and the company is looking for a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering plus two years of experience in a mechanical engineering role plus knowledge of X, Y, and Z plus etc. etc. You're going to have to show that you have an employment verification letter showing that you have the experience, the knowledge, and so forth. So the amount of evidence that you have to gather for the perm process is not as heavy as the EB1 as the EB2, okay? So it's a more straightforward process, and it's less likely to go wrong than the EB2 and the EB1 because there is no, it's not as subjective as the other two. Um, I don't know if you paid attention, but I said that the sponsors of the PERM can also be individuals, okay? Not only companies. So if you have an individual sponsoring you, most likely you are looking for a household employee, okay? But you can have, for example, an individual that does business as a sole proprietor and doesn't have a, an actual company registered with the state. So that person can also be your sponsor, okay? And it's, um, I guess it's, it, it's, it's good information here. 
um, as some people they don't even want to explore the perm as an option because they think a uh, US company has to be involved in the process and that's not the case. Um, for the perm process remember that I said that the Department of Labor is the one setting the minimum wage that the company has to offer. So I have clients that they would qualify for the EB2 and the, or the EB3 through the perm process, but we have to go with the national, the national interest waiver one because the company is now willing to pay the salary that the Department of Labor is asking the company to offer. Because with the EB2 and IW, there is no requirement that the company pays a specific salary or shows ability to pay. You can go to the next slide. Well, you are in school and you meet the love of your life. <laughs> and hopefully the love of your life is a US citizen or a green card holder. <laughs> Not someone like you. So if you meet this person, um, that person can sponsor your green card, okay? Um, what you have to show, one, that you live in a bona fide marital relationship. So basically you are not paying for your green card <laughs> and this person is not doing a favor for you. You really, you are a real couple, okay? Same-sex marriage is recognized. Oops. Um, and the person also is not only showing that you live in a bona fide marital relationship, but the person can um, give you enough money so you don't become a public charge. So the company, must, the, 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 the individual, the US citizen or the green card holder has to show that they make at least above the poverty guidelines based on the number of people in their household. Okay. And that salary is not too high, for example, for a household with two people, it's about $25,000, okay? So you are not talking about big numbers as we are talking with the employment-based green card. Things to consider, when you are doing any type of green card, okay, if you have committed any type of criminal violation or immigration violation that might be um, either a showstopper or you're gonna need to go through a waiver process before getting your green card. And not everybody would qualify for a waiver process. Uh, waiver process. With the marriage-based green card, um, if you are marrying a US citizen, even if you are here illegally, let's say you are working illegally or you have um, your F1 program finished and you just decided to stay in the US, for example, you're, you are okay to fix your papers inside the US. Those two violations are automatically waived. But if you are marrying a green card holder, then no. Those are not, you have to go for a process to request a waiver for some violations, including being here illegally, and you might have to leave the US to process your green card application from abroad. Yes. So, historically, the waiting time to get a green card through a marriage, either with a US citizen or a green card holder, were the same very quick. But then since last year, the, the visa category for spouses of green card holders have been backlogged, meaning the waiting time now to get a green card through marriage to a green card holder is about two to three years, okay? Um, and there is, we don't, we cannot tell if in the foreseeable future this is going to change. I hope so. But it is adventurous to just marry a US citizen. 
Or let's say you have um, a spouse that is a green card holder and then in two years they will be able to apply for their US citizenship. You can start the process with them as green card holders, but then once they become US citizen, then you can change the visa category. Okay. Um, with any green card application, you're gonna have to show that you are physically fit to become a resident. So you're gonna have to go through a doctor's examination. You're gonna have to show that you are you have some vaccinations done. Um, and also do some blood testing. Okay. Um, bigamy is not allowed. Okay. And it, I have clients that say, oh, I, was, I got married in my home country, I did not get married here in the US. It doesn't matter. As long as your marriage is valid in the country war, where you got married, that's valid for U.S. immigration. And I also have clients that say, oh, I, I got married in, I don't know, in Europe, but since I am now married in the U.S., I don't have to divorce my ex-spouse. It's not the case. You need to get divorced before you can get married, okay? You can go to the next slide. So do you have any questions about the employment-based green cards or the marriage-based green card? I know we're gonna have a Q&A session, but I wanted to interact with you now if you have any questions. Okay, I'm super clear. Now, the F1 is student, right? I mean, I guess you know all of that. You have to show that you can pay your tuition, your living expenses, you have to show, of course, that um, you have the intention to leave the U.S. once your course of study finishes. You have to show um, that, of course, you cannot just keep in failing your classes. <laughs> you have to continue studying. You have to attend classes. You know now that since after COVID, 100% online classes are no longer acceptable, right? If you are studying English, for example. But there are some schools that they have the hybrid option where you can do some online classes and then you have to go in person for like the whole weekend or for a week to meet the physical um, presence requirement to keep your F1. But I don't wanna talk about the basic understanding of the F1. I wanna talk about the types of work permit available for you guys. You have the OPT that you all know that you can get pre-graduation or after graduation. Everybody gets one year of OPT. You cannot have more than 90 days of employment. That's okay that you volunteer that's okay that you work, um, that you have unpaid work. It doesn't have to be a position that you, of course you wanna get paid, right? <laughs> but um, some people that, they are close to that three month window of unemployment that they just volunteer to make sure that they are compliant with their EAD. And then if you graduate at least with a bachelor's degree in a STEM, um, in a STEM field, you can then work for an additional two years for a company that is E-verified, okay? So now, every company with more than 25 employees, they have to use E-verify. So if you work for a big company, most likely, they will be E-verified. And then you can extend your OPG for another two years. So you have a total of three years. But then I have people that they have, they have maxed out their OPT. They have worked three years. The company tried to sponsor another type of visa, let's say H1B, the person was not selected in the lottery. Now what, right? So they don't want to try the AB2 and IW, or they don't qualify, but they want to remain the US working. What's the option? Continue with the F1 visa. 
but then how can you get work authorization? There is something called the one CPT. Have you heard about that? One, yes, two. So the one CPT basically says um, the, the standard law is that you have to study at least one year before you are able to get your CPT. Um, but with CPT day one, what some schools offer, they offer the option for you to start, to start working since day one, since you start studying. So you transition from your OPT to an F1 and start working since you start studying again. It's very common for business administration degrees. I have seen some engineering degrees that you can do that. Um, and what they offer is you do your, own, your classes online, but then you just have to go once a semester to the campus to meet the physical presence requirement to keep your F1. But the CPT D1 is a good option, is an alternative for you to continue working for your employer without um, having a lot of headache. And some of the schools, their tuitions are very reasonable. They are not super, super high. And then the other option to work off campus is through a request of an employment authorization based on economic hardship. So let's say you have your sponsor living abroad, this sponsor has now lost their job, or they live in a country where inflation is super high, so their money is not, are not as valuable as they were when you came to the US. So you can request an employment authorization based on that. This is of course the exception to the rule, but this is an option for you to be aware of. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is the most common type of work visa that companies um, offer to their F1 students. So let's say you are working for a company and even though you have and you are studying something related to STEM, but your OPT is ending. The, o, the H1B is a very, I would say, comfortable type of visa for companies to apply. Because one, the position has to be in a special occupation, meaning the position requires at least a bachelor's degree in a specific field. The company has to pay you a salary that is accepted by the, by the Department of Labor, okay? The Department of Labor is not the one picking the minimum wage. The attorneys are, okay? Because there are four different levels, and we attorneys, we choose the one that is more, it's closer to what, what you're gonna be earning. The problem with the H-1B is that there is an annual quota. The government can issue only 85,000 visas a year. And I would say since seven years ago, there are more than 200,000 people applying for it. Okay. So now the chances of you being selected for an H-1B visa is about 25 to 30%. If you have at least a master's degree from a U.S. university, your chances are, are a bit, bit higher. Why? Out of the 85,000 visas available, 20,000 are set aside for master's degree individuals, and the other 65,000 to the other, other people. So if you have at least a master's degree, you're gonna have two chances of being picked in the lottery. The lottery now has been extended to this Monday, okay? 
it was expected to close yesterday, but then USCIS extended until this Monday. Noon Eastern time. So if you are working for a company, that's the time when you come to your job Monday morning <laughs> to ask your manager to add you to the lottery. So the first thing is the company must add your name to the lottery. This year the lottery opened on March 6th and it was expected to close on the 22nd. Now they extended until the 25 noon Eastern time. So once the, once the company adds you to the lottery, by the end of March, beginning of April, USCIS, which is the immigration agency, will notify um, the candidates that were selected in the lottery. Then the company has 90 days to file the actual petition. So if the petition is approved, you can only start working for the company as an H-1B visa holder on October 1st because that's when the fiscal year for immigration starts. The H-1B is initially valid for three years, and then you can extend for another three years. If you have an I-140, which is the petition for the employment-based green card, let's say you file for EB2 and IW, there are no visas available for you to get your green card, you can use that I-140 petition to continue extending your H-1B beyond that six years. What's the problem with the H-1B is that your spouse cannot work. Okay? The spouse will only be able to work after you have, for example, your I-140 approved, but then you are not able to apply for adjustment of status, then your wife can use the I-140 to apply for the employment authorization document. Um, what else you should know? I believe that's it. You can go to the next slide. Alrighty, so there is another type of temporary visa. So just recapping here, the F1, the H1B are not green cards. They are only temporary visas. You can just remain in the US for the duration of um, the purpose of your visit and then you are expected to leave. The O-1 visa is the same, it's a temporary visa. But it's a good alternative for people like you that would qualify for an EB-1A or an EB-2 in IW, and you wanted to switch faster from an F-1 to a, um, to a work visa. Because remember, the EB-1A or the EB-2 in IW might take as I said, EB1A six months, but the EB2 and IW two years, three years, who knows? So the O1 is a good alternative if you are not selected in the H1B lottery, for example, right? Because there is no um, time frame during the year that the company can sponsor you. The O1 is very similar to the EB1A in the sense of the statutory criteria are the same but the level of scrutiny, the level of review of this, the evidence is not as scrutinized as the EB1A, okay? So I don't wanna go over the criteria again. The one thing that is important to know is that with the O1, you need a sponsor. You cannot self-sponsor as the EB1A. You can have an agent, for example, being your sponsor, but the agent is usually like if you are an artist or an athlete, it's easier to get an agent than if you are actually working for a company. The uh, bad thing about the O1 is that spouses cannot work, okay? And there is no, um, there is no solution for that not working piece, like the H1B. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, I guess that's it. Um, I hope I, I mean, I gave you information that you didn't know. I hope that it was not boring. And uh, I guess we will have a break now, and then we're gonna have uh, our Q and A session. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Bruna. Um, we want to take a group photo real quick before um, we grab some lunch. After the lunch break, um, we'll do the Q&A questions. So everyone can come up to the front. Don't be shy. Yeah. Come on. 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 Come When, when you started, they were getting a lot of feedback. Can you hear some sort of noise? I don't know. Right. You heard me too? I, I hear it from outside. I feel like it sounds kind of like one of those. Oh, the yeah, speakers? Maybe something. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, okay. Hold on. I will check it again before the kids. That's okay. Yes, not yes. <laughs> <laughs> 